Not only did he engage in the critique of Maimonides' Aristotelianism, but he also lost his only son to the vicious Spanish pogroms of 1391. These collected writings illuminate both his intellectual achievements as well as the comfort he gave to the Spanish Jewish communities of his day. There's no shortage of necessary further rabbinic texts. Volumes in the near future will include the collected writings of Yosef Albo, Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Yitzhak uh, Halevi Herzog, whose fascinating work on Israel as a halachic state has never been translated before into English, and many, many more. From our Yiddish library, the collected novels of uh, Israel uh, Joshua Singer, edited by Professor Anita Norwich, bring back this excellent Yiddish author whom Dara Horn calls my favorite singer brother, I.J., the better novelist. The two volumes of his collected novels will appear, or they're currently at press and will appear next year, with the collected short stories, about half of which are currently in translation, following in 2025. The list of Yiddish works to be published is long, and Professor Ruth Weiss is advising us. From our Sephardi library, the collected works of Hacham Jose Faur will start appearing in 2023 and appear annually for the five volumes that this will comprise. From the Library of Jewish Literature, the collected works of Amy Levy, the first Jewish woman accepted to Cambridge University, reflects the struggle, her struggle with the Jewish world of London in the 1870s and 1880s. Her novels astound in their compassion and observation. Over the past three decades, much more of her writings have actually been discovered. The classic, this list of classic Jewish writers in European languages and Hebrew that needs rediscovery is massive. Herzl's is the first volume in our Zionist library to appear, and we expect to produce volumes of the works of early and later Zionist figures, Chabotinsky, Begin, Ben-Gurion, Achada Am, and a religious proto-Zionist anthology are all in the works, and more. We plan libraries of biblical, we plan the libraries of biblical and post-biblical writings, Jewish art, anthologies of Ethiopian and other Jewish groups literature. What goes around comes around. We acknowledge that we found the Library of America as a model to emulate excellent texts, excellent editing, concise notes and introductions well produced for the general but serious reader. That such a library for Jewish writing does not exist is frankly astounding. It's interesting that the mover, the prime mover of the Library of America was the um, critic Edmund Wilson. And he explicitly based it upon the French Pléiade series, which is now part of Gallimard, founded by a Russian born Jew, Jacques Schifrin. The Loeb Library of Greek and Latin Classics was founded and funded by James Loeb in 1911. It seems that books and series are in our blood and we're delighted to be part of that tradition. A special thanks goes to Susan and Roger Hertog, Lisa and Howard Lipschitz, Hilda and Isaac Applebaum, whose initial sponsorships enabled to get this project off the ground and into your hands. I've gone on too long but I wanted to contextualize our launch of the collected Zionist writings of Herzl. It's both a personal and professional pleasure to restore these writings into the hands, hearts, and consciousness of English speaking Jews today, and to help make whatever bridges we can between the two Jewish worlds of Hebrew and English. Thank you very much. Dear Matthew, Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov on the incredible work of the Library of the Jewish People, which of course is part of the uh, impressive conglomerate which you have built with Cohen and with Magid and so many other important publish publishing houses, as well as the enormous wealth of publications which you've come through. But today, of course, you celebrate a very important event because you're publishing through the Library of the Jewish People, the writings of Theodore Herzl. And as we enter the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel, 
hear from the Jerusalem, the eternal capital of the state of Israel, from the president's own. I want to congratulate you for placing Theodor Herzl as a jewel in the crown, because we have to remember Theodor Herzl. We have to in, in disseminate his writings, his the theories, his, his belief how the Jewish state should look like, and make sure that we follow in his spirit and in his vision. And this is what you've done by this wonderful publication. May you go from strength to strength, the Hatzlacha. Baruch Atarunai, Elohim Melcholam, Shechianu, Kimanu, Vigianu, Lazman Haze. I'm a very lucky guy. I've launched 14 different book projects in my life, and I never felt moved to get up here and start with Shechianu. Now, that may have to do with the growing Hitchardut in the Troy family, and we can talk about that in group therapy later. But when I thought about the significance of this moment, that as the president and as Matthew Miller and as Paul just defined it, it seemed the right thing to do. We're celebrating not just the completion of these three volumes. And I have to give a special shout out to Linda and Yoni and Dina and my other two kids, Leah and Aviv, who couldn't make it, um, my long suffering family. Uh, they know that the worst words out of my mouth when I come and I say, ah, oh, this project is going to be easy. Uh, and, and it was when Matthew originally spoke to me about it and said, all I need you to do is write the introduction. But then once you start actually reading 2,700 pages of Theodor Herzl, and you realize that he was only active for 11 years, and you say, okay, I'm going to write the introduction to try to explain to the next generation who Herzl was, what Herzl is all about but also to make it easier for the reader, why not write 11 more introductions, one for each year, 1894, 1895, 1896. And then you really have to do a deeper dive in and try to get the essence. And we know that the difference between one year and another is artificial, but it can also be very substantive. And so the project as usual, Linda <laughs> ended up being much longer and much more complex, but so much more exciting than anticipated. So a big round of applause to Linda and the family. So, it starts indeed as that personal moment of gratitude for me. But think also, and we're gonna go ahead, somebody, every time I go like this, we're gonna advance. Uh, think also of the significance of this week, um, that we just in August celebrated the 125th anniversary of the Zionist Congress, and some of us were lucky enough to be in Basel and walk where Herzl walked and sweat, where Herzl sweated because the air conditioning wasn't working so well, and, and really feel the power of the place and mark the miracle. Think of where the Jews were 125 years ago and think where we are today with all our challenges. And this week, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of November 29th, 1947, when Herzl's idea, which was conceived and finalized in the Jewish, the Judenstadt, the Jewish state, and the Zionist Congress, was then validated by the world. Now we know we don't need the world's validation. That's the icing on the cake. But at that moment, as we were suffering from the Shoah, as we were trying to anticipate how we're going to build and launch this Jewish state, it certainly was a great help. And so we say Shechianu, all of us, because we're living that miracle. And then, of course, as Matthew already said, we're launching the library of the Jewish people. Very modestly named project. And as you could hear from Matthew's vision, and to sit with Matthew just for a few minutes is so exciting. Because also you know him because you open up a Koran Sidur, you open up a Rob Sachs tax, you open up a Steinsaltz Talmud and you see the love of books this man has. You see how he is a publisher who's automatically says yes, not no. He always says, how can we do it? How can we push? And when you ask him to put an ad in the Jerusalem Post in 
you're reading late Friday night um, and, and you go through the magazine, you don't see it, you say, okay, well, maybe he forgot. But then the next morning you open up page six and there's this huge two thirds page ad, that's Matthew, always over the top, always generous, always thinking, how do I move mountain? And if we think about the power of this vision, Daniel Gordas, when he was talking to me about this uh, extraordinary initiative, said, think about the Zionist revolution and the American revolution. There were two literary revolutions. We know that the notion of people of the book was kind of imposed on us by our Muslim brothers and sisters, but nevertheless, we've taken it as a compliment. Am HaSefer. And it is actually quite depressing how ignorant so many Jews today are. We are the most sophisticated, the most credentialed, the most PhD to MSW to MA to AB generation in Jewish history. And yet we're so deeply Jewishly illiterate. And this is an attempt to push back. And when I met with Matthew and he said, next slide, the Library of America, I think I'm actually one of the few nerds in Jerusalem who knew what he was talking about. Because I remember the excitement when it was launched. And when they first launched it, they were very much in the box. Uh, just doing you know, the great thinkers, um, often with the same look. But over the years, and we can look also at the next slide, we've seen how even their, their look has changed, their vision has broadened, Ray Bradbury is part of it, Philip Roth is part of it, um, on Arendt, uh, James Feminor Cooper. It's about the great thought leaders. Be they novelists, science fiction writers, statesmen and women. And the opportunity to be a part of a very, very small part of this very, very big project was something that I couldn't say no to. And, and one more, and, and so I was thinking about how do we celebrate it? And I was reading about David Ben Gurion and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, I know we're in a holy Begin spot, but we'll uh, mention Ben Gurion. Um, and uh, when David Ben Gurion, on that magic day in May, read the Proclamation of Independence. Right afterwards, Rabbi Yehudu Leib Maimon got up and he said the Shekhianu. So I thought, aha, that's it. That's why you have to start with the Shekhianu. And there's also, of course, a great Herzl moment connected to that, which is that when Herzl comes to Basel 125 years ago, he says the only moment of great anxiety he had wasn't about the big speech he was gonna give at the start of the Congress wasn't the big speech he was going to give at the end of the Congress. The Congress started on a Sunday, and that Shabbat, the day before, he got an aliyah in the temple in Basel. And he said, I was anxious about getting the bracha right. Because Herzl, as you can see from his bearing, had a very strong sense of his own dignity, and he didn't want to stumble over the words. And in Basel, some of our religious Zionist friends chose to reinterpret that um, and say, oh, this showed his religious excitement. And I went back to Uri Bolag, who did this extraordinary job of translating uh, so many of um, Herzl's writings and updating the translation from the 1960 edition, which uh, Matthew mentioned. And I said, let's go back, what was the word? And he said, the word was beklemung, which means anxiety um, and not spiritual excitement. And I actually think, I love the fact that he was nervous. And I think it's actually a story we should tell every bar and bar mitzvah, bar, bar and bat mitzvah girl and boy um, that, yeah, it's nerve wracking to get those Jewish words right. So um, as we continue, as Matthew said, in 1960, Harry Zahn comes out with the complete writings with a uh, introduction and edited by Raphael, Raphael Patai, who was a great Zionist thinker and activist in his day. But there were certain things that were missing. And there were certain things that also just had archa archaic translations. And so this initiative of the Zionist, uh, the first three volumes of the Zionist writings, the first three volumes of what will be the multi-inauguration, multi-volume Zionist uh, Library of the Jewish People, first went through that translation and updated it. And again, Uri did the hard work. I'm sure there's some German word for the Kolmenskuk and Skakenskik that he, uh, that he did. Um, uh, going through updating it, but he also did two really important things as we continue. Um, he brought us to who Herzl all is. And he helped us get away from 
the Hertzl who's just known for the big beard or the fancy new socks that Stephanie was kind enough to buy for me. He's been shtickified. We have to know the Herzl of words, not just the Herzl of beard. But in fact, if you think about it, it's actually quite extraordinary. When I say Maimonides or the prophets Devora or Moshe Rabbeinu, you might think of their words, but you don't really have an image of who they were. Herzl was the first visual Jew, the first beautiful Jew. And he was very conscious of that. And so as important as the words are, it's also important to look. And of course, today we also know that so many young Israelis even know Herzl. Next slide. Uh, as you know, Herzliya and um, a ship and a beer bottle and, um, and all kinds of monuments. We have to go back. And when we read these diaries, we read about Herzl the tinkerer. He wakes up morning after morning thinking about what will my Jewish state look like? He wakes up day after day thinking about how do we push this idea? And he wakes up every day knowing that the power of an idea is the force that can move history and that can save the Jewish people from their paralysis, from their trauma after so many years. And so one of the other things that Ori did as we continue is um, bring us back to the Herzl who had its ups and downs. Herzl's life was very short, but unfortunately, it was long on tragedy. He had a very problematic marriage to his wife, Julie. He wanted to divorce even before their firstborn uh, appeared on this earth. Um, the kid's story was even more depressing. We go to the next slide, even worse. Um, there's an amazing book, The Princes Without a Home. What happened to Yisab Herzl's children? And I heard actually this week that in the anti-Zionist, ultra-religious community, people say, oh, Herzl, he had no grandchildren who were Jewish. Well, the sad thing is, he had no grandchildren. Paulina died of a drug overdose as a morphine addict in Paris. His son Hans committed suicide a week later, distraught over his sister's death. And the third daughter, Margarita Trudy, was killed in Theresienstadt. The central defining relationship in Herzl's life was his relationship with his parents. And in fact, in the diaries, you discover that he was hoping to move to England, which is why we put so many Brits on the program tonight. And his parents made it very clear that it wasn't gonna happen. They refused, he wrote, to come along at any price. Now, those of us who are Olim, uh, who many of whom left our parents, want our children nevertheless to learn that lesson. So don't do what we did, but uh, do what Herzl did. He didn't move to England out of respect for his beloved parents. And uh, they, they were the ones who really gave him the anchor and uh, also the financial backing. I grew up with a myth that Herzl died of a broken heart after the fight of Uganda. And what's shocking is you read the diaries is you see that the angel of death is constantly dancing with him. The angel of death is constantly pursuing him. He often feels his heart misfiring. He often feels weakness. He often feels these palpitations. He's way more aware of his impending death than I am. Maybe he's a great person. Um, and at the age of 36, he writes a will. It's proper to be prepared for death, he says. My name will grow after my death. He's tr he trusted a future generation will be better able than the masses of the present to judge what I have done and what it meant to the Jewish people. Now, I'm trying to understand this. Next slide. I went back to a book that had been on my shelf since the 1970s, which many of us had on our shelves in the 1970s, but nobody opened it. And it's called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. And in that book, Becker explains that the zeal, the urge to create, the zeal, the urge to make your mark is an attempt to achieve immortality, to transcend our human bodies and be a part of something greater. And you feel that sense of urgency with Herzl. You feel that sense of, okay, I'm gonna launch this Zionist Congress and I'm gonna leverage barely 200 people in a room into pretending that I am the king of the Jews and meet with the czar and meet with the Kaiser and meet with prime ministers and meet with presidents because I've got to get this done. The house is on fire. The Jewish people are in trouble. 
but also I myself have to deny death. And we continue, and we go to actually one of the most important things in these new volumes is not a new translation, not a retranslation, but the first English translation, I believe, of a play that Herzl wrote, The New Ghetto. And look at the date. November 8th, which actually happened to be my mom's birthday. I'm um, 1894. This is a week and a half before Alfred Dreyfus is arrested. Here he is writing a, a play, struggling with the Jewish problem, struggling with Das Judenfrage, the Jewish question, already traumatized by the hope he had as an enlightened Jew to be accepted and the trauma he experienced by enduring anti-Semitism, enduring anti-Semitism in the university when Richard Wagner dies and his buddies, his brothers, the members of his dueling fraternity celebrate an anti-Semitic eulogy. And he draws a line in the sand. He says, I'm leaving this fraternity. And he's the only one, no one joins him. Not the Jews and not the non-Jews. And that happens 13 years before. But here's the problem with the new ghetto. It has no hatikva. It has no hope. It's filled with despair. If we continue when we read just two quotes, we see his sarcasm. We see his humor. We also see his despair. He, there's not one inspiring Jewish character. And in fact, in, this, in these two uh, exchanges, we see um, uh, they're asking, did you see Schlesinger at Temple? Wearing a Parisian dress. Is that what I'm supposed to pay attention to at Temple? A line that could have been written in Halsell's Jewish Center and Bashar Shemaim and every synagogue I went to back in the home country. And uh, Reinberg says, uh, I, was, I, was, I want to see if it's good for the gold business. If I had seen you at Temple, I wanted to give you an order. Now it's too late. And Wasserson says, my bad luck. But who thinks of business at Temple? Amazing how contemporary it is. Now watch what happens as we go to the next slide. When he writes Alt Neuland, King's Court, the non-Jewish character, the representative of all non-Jewish attitudes, says when he goes to the opera, finally he sees bejeweled women, finally he sees Jews showing off, finally he sees materialistic Jews. That's what I expect to see. But now, in Old New Land, at home, he says, no offense. And she, Mrs. Gottland, who lives now in this new Jewish state says, no offense is taken. That doesn't bother us at all, Mr. King's Court. Such remarks could have hurt us in the past, but not anymore, you understand? In the past, promenade boys, show-offs, and bejeweled Hebrews were seen as representatives of the Jews. Take that, David Chappelle. Now it's known that there are other Jews as well. You can rant as much as you like about this rabble, noble stranger. When it gets dark, I'll join you. We see that by normalizing, by creating a Jewish state, we can get out of the problem of anti-Semitism. And so ultimately that was, we continue, Herzl's vision. It was after struggling with the Jewish question for so long, Herzl's greatness is that as traumatized as he's been for 13 years by the words of Eugene Durin, which he read in 1883, when he was 23 years old, a book that came out in 1881. We continue as, continue again, as traumatized as he was by understanding that the word elend in medieval German means both misery and exile, and that's what's been synonymous with the Jews for so long. That's who we are. And so, in the new ghetto, he's despairing. So much so that Arthur Schnitzler, a far more successful playwright in Vienna, says to him, reads, he reads the new ghetto, and he says, Herzl, don't do this. Teddy, this is too negative. There's not one positive Jewish character. And Herzl says, this is who I see. This is who they are. And so in 1908, Schnitzler writes uh, a novel the road to the open, and he writes, his character says, I myself have only succeeded up to the present in making the acquaintance of one genuine anti-Semite. It was a well-known Zionist leader. 
In three weeks in a burst of playwriting, Herzl writes the new ghetto, trying to exorcise all the burdens of the Jewish people. But during those three weeks, if you go to the next slide, the Dreyfus affair happens. And from the even greater trauma, the even greater despair, the even greater shock of Dreyfus, Herzl doesn't spin into a tailspin, but he does what I call the jujitsu, J-E-W. He turns the negative into a positive. He understands that it's time to solve the Jewish problem. He understands, it's, it's almost like he had to get to the edge of despair, see how much he could hate himself and the Jewish people and the broken downedness of the Jewish people in order to turn it around. And he turns it around with this vision that we are a people, that we have ties to one particular homeland. And whatever goes on with Uganda, fundamentally, he's deeply tied to Palestine and deeply tied to establishing a Jewish state in the Jewish homeland. And understanding, and this has shaped my work for the last 20 years, understanding how important it is, not just to be strong externally, not just to have a nationalism, a liberal nationalism, which creates a Jewish democratic state, but also what I call identity Zionism. Have an, your own internal revolution. And I'll finish with my favorite story from the Herzl writings, the menorah. In 1894, when he's just getting into this Jewish thing, he's getting ready to light the Christmas candles on the Christmas tree in his home. And the chief rabbi of Vienna walks in and he writes only one of them is embarrassed, the chief rabbi, not Herzl. He has some Jewish consciousness, he has some Jewish literacy, but he's not deeply in it. And then two years later, he writes about a Jew who had lost his ties, who had lost his way, and who had been traumatized by all the hatred. And lo and behold, he discovers the light. And he decides to celebrate this holiday of Hanukkah. And so he comes home with the menorah and he's really struck by the beauty of the candelabra, how it has, how it's like a tree, a tree of life. And they start with two candles the first night, and then three, and four, and five. And every night they bring more light in. And of course, you know, halakhically, the light has to be going outside. And so it's an external light that says to the rest of the world, we are a people, we are proud, we have ties to a particular Jewish state, we have ties to a particular homeland, and we have the right to establish a state on that homeland. But he also understood that it's about an inner light too. And that, we know, is where political Zionism and identity Zionism meet. That we know is what living in Jerusalem is all about. That we know is the great miracle that we're celebrating when we say Shechianu Kiyamanu, not just about this extraordinary library of the Jewish people, not just about this little contribution to this greater project, but to the miracle we're celebrating this week, 75 years after 1947. And so thank you very much for being a part of the miracle. Thank you very much for being a part of my life, so many of you. You know, everybody always likes to say, what would Herzl think? And that is usually asked at a time when they're sort of frustrated with something that's happening in Israel. So half the country asked that, after the fourth election, the other half of the country asked it after the fifth election. And as someone who remembers that when John Kennedy was first assassinated, all his advisors who wanted him to stay in Vietnam said, oh, President Kennedy would have stayed in Vietnam. And then three, four years later, as the Vietnam War became less and less popular, they said, oh, no, he would have pulled out of Vietnam. And it was this game of what would they think is dangerous. But what would Herzl think if he came here today and he saw each and every one of you and he knew all the amazing good works that each one of you has done and knew your souls and knew your families and knew your values, Herzl would say, I've done good. So thank you so much for being a part of my life. And thank you so much for being here tonight. When we talk about, when we talk about somebody who has had a Herzl moment, who's recognized her need and her role in Jewish history, to stand up and say, I am Jewish and I am proud, and I'm standing up for truth and I'm standing up for justice, and I'm standing up for justice, I'm standing up for righteousness. There's no clearer voice than Melanie Phillips. Melanie Phillips understands the menorah story. 
that it's about the inner light and about the external light. So it's my great privilege and my honor to call upon Melanie Phillips. Thank you very much indeed, Gil, Eretz Tov, everybody. Um, it's a really great pleasure to be here this evening. Um, it's obviously a fantastic project, and there can be no more appropriate and really exciting uh, volume to start this project uh, than these books about Herzl and his works. I look forward very much to, to reading them. Um, it's, uh, Gil was too kind, but nevertheless, um, uh, Herzl, uh, to me, uh, obviously is a deeply fascinating uh, and very complex figure, much more complex than many of us, including myself, uh, realized until quite recently. But I also, as Gil has intimated, uh, presumptuously, I've always felt a bit of a, bit of a kindred spirit uh, with Herzl, apart from, of course, the beard. Um, uh, because um, as an assimilated uh, journalist in Britain, uh, I also had an aha moment about Judaism and about Israel. In fact, I had a series of aha moments. And I've long thought that Herzl's story rings many bells for me. Uh, my first aha moment, I mean, I think, I think Herzl said it took him about 13 years uh, to realize what he should have realized a long time ago. And for me, uh, that process started in 1982 when I was a journalist at The Guardian uh, in London and the Lebanon war was underway. Um, and uh, it took me until that uh, rather seismic moment when I realized that Britain, uh, Britain's anti-Semitism problem hadn't just not gone away, but had come roaring out of the closet again. It took me a through a series of in an increasing uh, number of shocks, uh, which culminated for me uh, in uh, the year 2000, uh, when the uh, Second Intifada was underway uh, and Israel in Britain was immediately called a Nazi state for seeking to quash uh, that terrible uprising. Um, it took an, until, that poem, uh, until that moment for me to realize uh, that we'd all been living in a fool's paradise. And I remember very, very clearly how a number of British Jews at the time uh, said to each other and to ourselves, uh, we have, they used these words, we have been living in a fool's paradise. Uh, we thought anti-Semitism had gone. Uh, we now realize we were merely living in a kind of 50 year holiday from history and it's now back and it never went away. Now, some of us took a conclusion from that and uh, basically I'm here today because of that conclusion. And many, many British Jews and other Jews in the diaspora took a different view and are, are still there. Now, the uh, Herzl obviously um, uh, uh, what, what, uh, was on a journey of his own. And it rings a very contemporary bell to me, uh, not just about the ubiquity and uh, never endingness uh, of anti Semitism, but about the attitude of diaspora Jews, which in many ways is so very similar to what he lived through and what he exemplified, certainly at an earlier stage in his life. Uh, he uh, represented and he was surrounded by a type that is very familiar to me and I expect to many of you, uh, the assimilated, uh, sophisticated uh, literary Jew uh, with an entirely ambivalent attitude towards him or her, his or her Jewishness. In Herzl's time, and Herzl himself uh, was infatuated with German culture. He was, uh, although he was born in, 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 in Hungary, uh, he was from a German, a Germanified family. German culture was considered to be the absolute uh, uh, apex of high culture. He attended a Protestant gymnasium. His youthful hero was Luther. He refused to circumcise his son. As we've heard, he had a Christmas tree and lit candles on the Christmas tree for his children. And he represented a period in European Jewish life in which European Jews, in which a, a, an extraordinary phenomenon was, was, was occurring. Uh, European Jews had become extraordinarily 
assimilated and successful uh, in Vienna, in Germany, uh, Jews rose to the highest levels of German and Austrian political, professional, and cultural life. And yet, at the very same time, all around them, their societies were becoming more and more pathologically hostile uh, to Jews. Uh, in 1895, a year before the Dreyfus Affair, the vicious anti-Semite Karl Luger was elected mayor of Vienna. At the time, Vienna was run by Jews in the sense that they were dominant in its cultural and professional life. And this, this man, Luger, was elected and he was, became a role model uh, for, for Hitler. And the following year, uh, uh, Herzl had this shattering uh, experience of the Dreyfus affair, uh, which, came, which, 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 which led him to the conclusion uh, that Jews would never be safe unless they were in their own homeland. But it was a process that he went through, one shock after another. At every stage, he tried not to believe what was unfolding in front of his eyes. So deeply committed was he, not just to German culture, but to the ideal behind German culture uh, of, of reason, uh, of goodness coming out of reason, and of the German people being so cultured and so reasonable and so well-educated that they had to exemplify all these good things. And so at every stage, he tried to deny it and deny it and deny it until eventually he couldn't. But even after the Dreyfus affair, uh, he was conflicted. He tried to reconcile in his mind the uh, enlightened approach of the Europeans with the reality uh, that, the, uh, that for the Europeans, the Jews uh, who were so assimilated in their own minds that they were actually unassimilable. Now, I'm afraid to say that today we see a similar incredulity and blinkered denial by so many diaspora Jews. Look at uh, mainland Europe. Uh, mainland Europe is under an onslaught from Muslim anti-Semitism, which in France in particular has taken frequently murderous form. And yet so many Jews in Europe and looking at Europe try and either deny this, minimize it or ignore it. And although this is coming from very different, uh, into very different circumstances, Herzl would certainly recognize uh, in the indifference of the majority in France the absence of empathy with the Jewish people, uh, which he observed uh, in the France of his day. And of course, in his day, it wasn't just an absence of empathy, it was active hostility. And as we know, many French Jews have come here, although many have also stayed in France. But the levels of denial, I suggest, are even greater in Britain and America, where anti-Semitism has reached record levels and yet the Jewish communities in Britain and America mainly have their heads in the sand or else they are looking resolutely in the opposite direction. In Britain, for example, many British Jews reacted with visceral horror uh, when Jeremy Corbyn uh, was leader of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn was a hard left leader under his aegis. Uh, Anti-Semitism became ever more brazen and ever more epidemic in the party. Long story short, Corbyn has gone. He's been replaced by Sir Keir Starmer, a very decent guy. He's married to a Jewish woman. Keir Starmer said he would make it his business to cleanse the Labour Party of anti-Semitism. He took some very well publicized moves to do so. And that's it. Job done. Labour Party cleansed of anti-Semitism. And guess what? The British Jewish community says, Fantastic, we can now go home again. We can go home to labor, it's all over. We don't have a problem anymore. Anti-Semitism is coursing through the left. It takes the form classically today of hatred of Israel. This confuses the matter. Nevertheless, it's not confusing to anybody with eyes to see. Unfortunately, so many British Jews don't see it because they don't want to see it. Very similar, I would suggest, although the circumstances obviously are very different, but very similar to the mindset in Germany and Vienna, in Europe, in those years that Herzl was looking in such, with such, such horror at what was going on. 
if you look at uh, uh, in America, uh, where it's a different situation, again, there the majority of Jews have embraced the universalizing ideologies which are antithetical to the very specific, highly specific and inherently separatist values of Judaism. And they are also antithetical to the ideals of Zionism and of Israel. These things all go together. But there, so many American Jews tell themselves that these values which are antithetical to Israel, antithetical to Judaism, are in fact authentic Jewish values. Why do they say such things? Why do these communities not see what is so plain to so many of us and should be so obvious to them? And I would suggest it's because both communities are increasingly subscribing to falsehoods about Israel in particular, uh, so that they are increasingly unable to detect the true level of the venom against the Jewish people and where it's coming from. And that's partly why there is such a high level of denial. But the reason for it, I would suggest is the same in both cases, in Britain and America, because despite their many differences, both in Britain and America, the Jewish community is trying all the time to find ways of denying the reality and the extent and the scope of anti-Semitism in the surrounding society in order to achieve their overwhelming and desperate need to fit into the surrounding culture, to pretend they are not different from everyone else. They tell themselves there are no barriers between them and non-Jewish Brits or non-Jewish Americans. Just as Herzl and the Jewish communities of Vienna and Germany sought to rid themselves of every single characteristic of Judaism that could make them separate, and that th therefore they believed that therefore they were as German or as Austrian as the Germans or the Austrians, it wasn't true then and it's not true now. It's a fool's paradise that diaspora Jews are living in, what I came to understand and believe was that whatever, however comfortable life is in the diaspora for Jews, you are there on sufferance. And it takes different forms and it can be very benign sufferance, but you are there on sufferance. You're basically there on your knees. And if you stand up as a proud Jew, you feel it. Then you feel what it is to be a Jew uh, in, uh, in the diaspora. Now, the second point that leads on from that, that I would like to make is that this of course was Herzl's mistake. Herzl believed that if the Jews had their own state, it would solve the Jewish problem. It would solve the problem of anti-Semitism. It would make the Jews safe. Well, we here believe that we are safe or safer, but the reality is that Israel has become the Jew among nations. Far from getting rid of the Jewish problem, far from ending the Jewish problem, getting rid of anti-Semitism, Israel is subjected to the same kind of bigotry, the same kind of, of hatred and hostility uh, as individual Jews have over the millennia. Israel is picked on as the collective Jew. And of course, the rise of epidemic anti-Semitism in the diaspora today is intimately bound up with the issue of Israel, the prejudice against the collective Jew. We know that anti-Semitism is always present, but we also know that anti-Semitism becomes epidemic in periods, in era, in, 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 in periods of, of profound cultural dislocation. Uh, when Herzl uh, was around, uh, and in fact, during the whole of the, much of the 19th century, this was a century of tremendous upheavals, cultural upheavals, the rise of secularism, uh, the rise of nationalism, revolutions uh, uh, every five seconds. And at such periods of cultural upheaval, people turn on Jews as the scapegoat. And it's very similar today. We are living through an era of profound cultural changes, which are very frightening to a lot of people. Profound changes in, in the structure of society, in the family, in the nation, uh, the rise of Islam, the rise of universalism uh, as a creed, uh, and the displacement 
of uh, the idea that one should be proud of one's nation. These are all great cultural uh, 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 dislocations which are going on, which are parallel, I would suggest, to what was going on in the 19th century uh, in Herzl's time and beyond, and, and, and before that. And my final point is this, that one of the uh, deepest lessons of Herzl's tortured and contradictory attitudes was this, that his Zionism, as far as I can see, and I may, my view may change uh, having read, uh, if, if, if I read your, your, your set of volumes, but it seems to me that his Zionism was conceived absolutely as a defensive project to save the Jews. He did not realize until very late on indeed, if indeed he realized at all, the centrality of Judaism itself to a Jewish homeland. For most of his Zionist career, his Zionism was not very Jewish. In the Judenstadt, he, in, 19, in 1896, he said, Palestine is our unforgettable historic homeland, but it could be in Argentina or it could be in Palestine. And we know that uh, towards the end of his life, uh, he uh, allowed himself to go along with the idea that it could be that the Jewish homeland could start in Uganda. Okay, that was a kind of temporary measure. But nevertheless, his new national home for much of his right, period of his writing, it seems to me, his new national home would have been a multicultural, multilingual homeland, rather like Switzerland. Because to him, Jewish identity was negative, not positive. He described the Jews as a historical group of people who clearly belong together and are held together by a common foe. Well, that's a very bleak view. If Jews, if, 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 if Jews are only held together by a common foe, well, certainly they could have, we, we could have settled in Uganda or Argentina, but Jewish identity is not composed of negatives. It does not derive from the hostility of others. We are not kept together only by our common foe. If that were really so, the Jewish people would have disappeared long ago. Jews have been subjected to constant persecution wherever they have settled, long before Herzl's awakening, uh, both through persecution and also we, the, the, the Jews have lost millions through the pressures of assimilation. Nevertheless, while millions were lost to assimilation and to persecution, the people as a Jewish people have survived. And although the religion was reinvented to, adopt, uh, to adapt to the loss of the temple and the homeland in the land of Israel, Jewish identity has re re retained the principles of faith laid down in the Hebrew Bible, practiced in the temple times. Zionism may have meant something different to Herzl, at least in part of his life and character, but its development tapped into the fact that Judaism is composed of the unbreakable bond between the people, the religion, and the land. Zionism, the self-determination of the Jewish people within that land, was much more than a rescue remedy. It was much more than just rescuing the Jews from their oppressors in the non-Jewish world. Zionism, in its modern manifestation, enabled the Jewish people as a people to become whole once again. And of course, this contradiction remains in Israel today. Is uh, Israel, was it, it from the founding fathers onwards, the question was, was Israel uh, going to be the Jewish redemption, the, re the, the redemption of the Jewish people as, as predicted and as, as yearned for throughout millennia of Jewish history? Or was it to be the emancipation of Jews to become a different kind of Jew, one in which religion had been replaced by nationalism? But nationalism without a shared culture, tradition, history, religion is ultimately shallow and meaningless. Switzerland, for example, is famous for the Alps, political neutrality, and the cuckoo clock. But the Jewish people laid the foundations for human dignity, conscience, and civilization. And that is what Israel is about. And just like Judaism and the Jewish people are unique, so Israel would always be and is unique. And with that uniqueness comes the unique hatred directed at the Jewish people since the beginning. Herzl did not solve the Jewish problem. He could not solve the Jewish problem. The Jewish problem cannot be solved. So the question is to take Gill's question and turn it slightly on its head. 
If Herzl were alive today, what would he have thought of his project? Given that he thought that Jewish self-determination in, in their own homeland would solve the Jewish problem, would end anti-Semitism, would he have thought that since Israel is the lightning rod now for global Jew hatred, that the state of Israel shows that his project had failed? Or would he have seen the hope and the inspiration and the achievement here and had the humility and the insight into Judaism to realize that he still had a great deal to learn about Judaism? I rather like to think it would have been the latter and that if he had been here today, he would have used his presence here to continue on his great and tumultuous journey as we all are on that journey together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie Phillips. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Gil back onto the stage and also to join him, uh, Jakob Katz, the editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post um, and author, author of the critically acclaimed Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, also the co author of Weapon Wizards, How Israel Became a High Tech Military Superpower and Israel versus Iran, the Shadow War. Uh, Yaakov served close to a decade as the Jerusalem Post military reporter and defense analyst. He was a lecturer at Harvard, where he taught an advanced course in journalism, and also served as Israel correspondent for Jane's Defense Weekly. Uh, prior to taking up the role of editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Yaakov Katz served two years as a senior policy advisor to Israel's Minister of, Minister of Economy and Minister of Diaspora Affairs. And um, he is originally from Chicago, has a law degree from Maryland University, and uh, I think is as someone who is uh, more responsible than most for um, bringing Israel to the English-speaking world, I thought it was particularly appropriate that he's here as we're talking about the uh, the English uh, the en English-speaking exposure to uh, to Israel and Zionist ideas. So, Jakob Katz, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you, Melanie. That was uh, amazing. You know, I. I learn from you when I agree with you, and I learn from you when I disagree with you, and that's the reason why I love uh, listening to you and 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 reading you. Um, and indeed, I think the, the the key word is journey. That he was very much on his journey. And one of the things I most love about the diaries, uh, and by the way, our anti-Semitic friends love to go through the diaries and take one phrase and say, "You see, he was a colonialist. You see, he was this. You see, he was that." And one of the things I emphasize in the introduction is that it's kind of like and I'm lucky to have an artist in the family, an artist's sketchbook, where he just kind of is, 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 is working his, his ideas out, and you definitely see him on that journey. Um, and and it, was, it was great to hear uh, your framing, and it's also great to have you, Yaakov, here. Um, I, I write my column, it appears every Wednesday, but I tend to write it on Sundays. And um, every Friday when I read your column, I either go, oh no, because I was going to write that column, um, or oh yes, we can now have be in conversation, and it's a, a thrill to be in conversation um, in person, uh, and, and it's kind of a kick to interview the journalist, because uh, uh, kind of turning the tables on you. Uh, the whole idea of this evening is to struggle with the question of does Herzl matter? Is he just a historical figure? Can we just offer these twenty seven hundred pages? Uh, to gather dust on the library shelf? Or just as he said that ideas can change history, can his ideas continue to change history? And um, so I want to start off with that very big uh, question. Melanie said that she had her aha moment, her Herzl moment. Um, I, uh, 20 years ago, uh, 21 years ago, when I was simply a middle child looking to be popular as an American historian, uh, saw that the Jewish people were being attacked and uh, at McGill University started standing up for uh, the Jewish people and learned, I think as Melanie has also learned, what it is to be attacked by people. And uh, I had to, I had my mantra, which is uh, Franklin Roosevelt always said, judge me by the enemies I make. And I think you <laughs> you too can be judged by, by, by some of those enemies. Um, and uh, I, I want to ask you, because you have a very different biography, you have a much more deeply Zionist and deeply Israeli biography. Have you had a Herzl moment? Have you, what, what's your, where does Herzl fit into your life? Well, 
<clears throat> First of all, Bill, congratulations, Matthew. Congratulations, Melanie. Always a pleasure to hear from you. And um, I just want to say before we begin that uh, before I answer, uh, how I think Gil is really one of the greatest thought leaders that we have today in the Jewish world. Um, and what I love about what you write and the name of the column center field, right, is really because I think what Gil does and what I try to maybe emulate also a bit in the column that I write once a week is that it's very difficult to be in the center because the center, you know, you, you could read what Gil writes one week and it's maybe leans a bit to the right. The next week it leans a bit to the left. It's complicated. It's, it's gray. It's not black and white. And I think that that's a, I, I find myself very much in that same space, uh, a conflicted and confused Israeli Jew, which I think probably a lot of people here are. And, uh, and I think you, you straddle that and, and, and live in that space very, very well and articulated. So I, I just want to say thank you very much for, for all you do. Um, I can't say that I had a Herzl aha moment. Uh, I was brought here as a teenager just in the summer before ninth grade. Um, it's now 30 years later almost. And so there's no moment that I could say, oh, you know, this is when I realized what it means to be a Zionist or to be a Jew. I don't think I knew who Herzl was, though, before I came to Israel, even though I had gone to a Jewish day school in Chicago. But what I can say, and I think probably a lot of people who are here and familiar faces that I've seen in the crowd of people who have decided to uproot themselves and move to this country and make a home and, and establish a family and create businesses and, and, and in industries and workplaces and employment for, for Israelis and Arab, Jews and Arabs and uh, Jews and Muslims and Christians alike, is that something that I, I realized years into living in this country, uh, and I still feel very much today, and I wonder if, if you share this feeling, is that we're all part of something bigger. People often, I'm sure they ask you, they ask me, they ask a lot of us, what is it about Israel? Why live in Israel? Well, you know, Melanie articulated uh, very well how there's so many challenges and threats. We're not safe yet here in Israel. I would argue, I would push back a bit. I think we are at a moment in history after 75 years, the strongest we've ever been as a Jewish people and as the state of Israel. But I recognize, of course, the threats that are, surround us all the time, everywhere. With that said, though, we're still, I feel that everybody in this country, from, from the, the plumber, and no offense to the plumbers, to the, to the garbage collectors, to the lawyers and the doctors and the journalists and the professors and the writers, we're all part of a, we're, we're putting our own building block into this country. I very much feel that. And I feel like it's still a work in progress. And that is something that, that I feel everyone has that Herzl moment in this country. Everyone who comes here, who makes their home here, everyone who is born here and lives here, whether it's our children who go to the army, and I have a daughter who's now three months in, it's, it's, it's that contribution to the safety, security, the perpetuation of the Jewish people. I think you're absolutely right that it is a work in progress. And there, there, there are two things. One is we're young and we're small, right? And, and, and coming from the United States of America, 330 million people, which is, is, is so vast and, and, and so overwhelming, uh, you come here, you feel like every person counts and, every, and, 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 and we, we mourn with every loss um, and we celebrate with every joy. And, and there is that sense of, of, of Akhtun. And I think it also goes back to one of the things that Melanie was saying at the end, which is the power of identity and, and the power of, of being a something, a country of somethings, not a country of nothings. And, uh, and, and having that, that range. And, and I think that that is part of Herzl's vision um, and, and the vision that he was coming to. And again, I emphasize that he only he died at the age of 44, so he was still very much a work in progress. But um, I think we're hearing like a number of, of tensions here, right? We're hearing the question of how much does anti-Semitism continue to hover over the Jewish people and over Zionism? How much of Zionism is anti-anti-Semitism? How much of Zionism today is anti-anti-Zionism? And how much of it is a more positive, affirmative, proactive uh, approach? And I think that was also one of the things that, that, that Herzl was struggling with. Um, when you, and, and it's interesting also, because your column has one voice, your books 
tend to be much more on the, on the military side of things. When you try to balance those two forces, that negative force and that positive force, how do you, how do you reconcile the two? And especially now that you say you have a child in the army, and by the way, once had a very important moment where you gave me some advice for, for my son who was facing some challenges in the army. So you also are, are, are a veteran. Um, I'm just a laptop warrior and uh, we honor those people who truly serve. Uh, how do you balance those two forces? I look at them as together, right? The, 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 I think that I, I've spent a lot of my writing career, which is now 20 years as a journalist, really focused on those military threats, whether it's the nuclear threat, whether it's terrorism, uh, rockets, missiles, you name it, military operations on a daily basis. But, but, but I do look at where we are in this point in history after 75 years of statehood. And, you know, I just today, as a matter of fact, I, I met with the governor of the Bank of Israel. I went down to, 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 to his office and had a meeting with him. And there's huge economic challenges that Israel has in the years ahead. Um, one of them, for example, I mean, Haredi employment is, is massive, right, which we have to solve. But that's a separate issue. But look at, look at you know, our economic growth. They, they predicted the projection was 6%. We're probably going to get to about 6% when the year ends. The projection for next year with the global recession, with, the, with the, everything that's going on, is going to be 3%. We're probably going to hit, they're hopeful that we'll hit 3%. You look at the economy, you look at our military, how powerful and strong we are today, right? And this, the eve of our 75th anniversary. Um, with military equipment and hardware that, that no one can even imagine we would have ever have had. Not to mention that none of our enemies and adversaries in this region have. When as dangerous as it is, we have the ability to defend ourselves in ways that I think no one would have thought, definitely not Herzl, that, that the Jewish people could have. And, and therefore, the question that I often think about more is, what do you do with this power that you have? And what is the responsibility that rests upon us as a country and upon our political leaders? And we're in a very interesting time when it comes to politics, of course. But as we always are, but what, what do you do now with this strength and power that you have? Because you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to your citizens. You have a responsibility to the other people who live in this land, right? Who we are still in a conflict with. And, and you have some issues that you might need to try to resolve. And wouldn't you want to maybe try to resolve those problems and challenges from a position of strength as opposed to a position of weakness? All this time you look through at least definitely the last 25 years or so, if you look definitely since the, the start of the Oslo Accords, right, in 93, it was always, we were always being pushed to do something from a position of weakness, with terror onslaughts, with massive diplomatic and political influence and pressure from different foreign powers. Today, we don't have that. So shouldn't we use this position and status that we have to achieve something maybe that we haven't yet been able to achieve? Michael Oren says that um, everybody loves to say Theodor Herzl, uh, if you will, it is no dream. We can't talk about Herzl without using that phrase at least once. But he said, I'm actually a Delmore Schwartzian Zionist. Delmore Schwartz was a beat poet uh, in the 1930s and 1940s in New York who wrote, in dreams begin responsibilities. And it's a great line that, that, that uh, connects to what you're saying and that bridges um, the, always that leap of hope that hatikva, that 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 vision that we have, uh, with the difficult responsibilities of day to day of just picking up garbage and making the city clean and and defending ourselves. Uh, and I want to add another uh, word into this conversation, which is about values. And I think right now that's actually one of the the key questions about when we're defending ourselves, and when we're driving to work, and when we're building a a, a new twenty first century and twenty second century economy. How much? Do Jewish values count in our equation? And how much do democratic values count in our equation? And I hate the fact that people look at Jewish and democratic as opposites, because I was often point out that where does democracy come from? We would like to give props to the Greeks, but it started with the Bible, it started with the notion of Tzalem Elohim, it started with the notion that every one of us um, has uh, a reflection of, of godliness in ourselves, which means that inherent equality. And without that leap, to equality, we wouldn't have democracy. So my question to you was, where do values count? Democratic values, Jewish values, being this truly a values nation, or are we just all about being a startup nation, are we just being about a survival nation? I think that Israel as a, as a journey or as a story is, is 
still has, it, it definitely has not yet been told, but we have to discover what is the narrative that we are telling ourselves in the world today, right? So when we were founded as a state, and you spoke about this, and Melanie spoke about this, but the 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 refuge, the sanctuary for the Jewish people, Jews and anti-Semitism, and, and we're hated and we're persecuted, and we need a place, whether it's Uganda, Argentina, thank God it's here in, in, in Sion, but we needed a place that we could call our own and protect ourselves by ourselves, and we were able to achieve that. But that has changed right now. We're strong. We're powerful. So what 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 happened in the last 15 years or so? We became we started telling ourselves this nice story that we're the startup nation, tikkun olam. We're developing things for the world. We're making the world a better place. But is that a Jewish value necessarily? Is that why we're here? Is there is is that the reason we're in this land? And I'll tell you something. You know, as someone who writes a lot about politics and meets a lot with a lot of politicians. What I often find is, you know, when the conversation, for example, gets to what we used to consider right and left when it came to the Palestinian issue, right, shtachim or not, territory or not, should we be there, should we not be there? So, you know, you talk to the people on the left and we have to get rid of everything, right? We have to pull out, we have to give it all away. And you think back to, you know, the Camp David talks and we're even Ehud Olmert, what he was willing to give to Abu Mazen back in the last big round in, in 2008 of 90 something percent of the West Bank. And you talk to people on the right, and it's very much, uh, it's all ours, we can't give up an inch. No one is willing to be in the middle, right? And, and it's very hard to find those people. But like, I, for example, I talk to the, you talk to the people on the left and you say, why can't we start the conversation from, yes, it is ours, right? We do have this connection to the land. And we're missing those types of conversations, I feel. That why are we here? What is the reason? What is the purpose? What are those values? What is the significance of Jews being in Israel today? That's something for our education system, right? It'll be interesting to see who the education minister is going to be, but uh, and whether they're up to the task. But I think that is something that that those values, that conversation, we're missing here in Israel often. By the way, I think that's also part of the vision of the Library of the Jewish People, right? That and uh, one of the best questions I've gotten from various friends is: Is this going to be translated into Hebrew? And I think um, Matthew would say, if we find the right donor, we'll, we'll, right, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. But it's essential because we have to have this conversation here. And since uh, I, I launched the Zionist Ideas, as Paul was kind enough to say right here, um, in, in the Begin Center, I've had a whole series of Zionist salons in Hebrew, in English, in different countries around the globe. Um, and, and I see that Israelis are also starving for that kind of values conversation. And you know, you can't be an author without being both incredibly humble because you know your books aren't really going to make a difference and a monomaniacally, uh, gargantuanly egoed visionary who thinks this word is going to change the life, is going to change the world. Um, and when I, when I get into that mode, I want Herzl's words to change the world. I want Herzl's words to help us understand as Jews and, and, and as Zionists and Israelis where we're going. I want that intense conversation about what can Herzl teach us? What would Herzl do? What would Herzl think? What would Herzl mean? And because I really do think that his centrism and his sense of peoplehood and his commitment to the survival of the Jewish people can get us going. Um, and I also want the, the broader conversation about what does it mean that we are this literary people? What does it mean that as Vanny Gorda said, we had this literary revolution? How do we go forward? And, um, and I think it's so important that you continue your work because you're continuing to, to, to keep us. It's funny, I, 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 I was wondering if, you know, given you're, you also have a political past, um, whether you, 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 you think that you actually make more of a difference when you're writing or did you think you made more of a difference when you were governing? Um, and, we, and in both those moments, how often do you go back to the ideology and how often do you think you're just sort of reacting? Because uh, unlike me, I just have to write a column once a week, you write a column once a week and help write an editorial and put out this darn paper day after day after day, thank God for Shabbat. So you never have time to breathe. How do you, how do you balance it all? Thank God for Shabbat. <laughs> um, but, but, but I will say is uh, I did, spending two years in government was enough for me. And uh, it was depressing because it's so difficult to get things done and you just see how much politics gets in the way. And we see that, you know, just be here for the last four years and, and the constant rounds of elections. Um, I think that we, you know, we, we have the, the ability, when we write these books, we write in a newspaper, wherever it is, we have the ability to influence hearts and minds, we have the ability to educate. I, I think you probably would agree with me. We're not looking necessarily to uh, brainwash people, but we're looking to educate, to inform, and to give people the ability and the skills and the knowledge that they can make their own educated decisions. 
and I think you do that amazingly, Gil. Uh, you know, you, you, you wrote to me at some point uh, in the run up to this event, if I have any recommendations for the Jewish People's Library. Of, so all I'll just say, I, I can't recommend my own books, but all of Gil, Troy's books, definitely Zionist ideas. I don't know about the ones about the presidents of the United States. I don't know if they should be there, but there's a bunch of them that should. So ladies and gentlemen, just a big round of applause again to Gil Troy. Well, thank you, Yaakov. My 92-year-old um, my father is watching uh, back in uh, Washington, DC. And I wanna say hello to him and I wanna say hello to so many people who are joining us on Zoom. And, um, and for him, the fact that we're in this holy of holy of uh, Menachem Begin is particularly important because I was one of those strange New York Jews who grew up worshiping in the shrine of Begin and not at Ben Gurion. Um, and it's taken me years to appreciate just uh, how much Ben Gurion did for the state. But um, Begin himself had a deep connection to Herzl. His father um, broke down the doors of the synagogue in order to make sure that on, uh, in, in July 1904, there would be a memorial service for, uh, for Herzl. And he wanted to name his firstborn Herzl, but it was a girl. And so he really pushed for Herzliya, but um, mom put her foot down and, uh, and, and the firstborn was, uh, was Rachel, but the second indeed was Herzl Begin and the third was Menachem Begin. Um, and so uh, it's, it's particularly significant, and I want to thank Paul for the amazing work you did in putting this in this event together. Uh, and 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 there, there's a certain point at which we well know that Begin fought with Ben Gurion, and uh, Ben Gurion fought with Jabotinsky, and 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 we're so aware of the pilug, we're so aware of the division. But when I come to this place. I always think of a step higher. I would think of where Begin and Ben Gurion and Jabotinsky and all the greats meet. And shortly after this recent election, uh, Avi Kochavi gave an important speech at Badakhar at the officers training center at their graduation. And he said, out there on the street, everybody yells and screams about politics. But here in Sahal, we're one. And I think here in places like the Ben Gurion center and the Negev and the Begin center right here, we're one. And so thank you, Paul. Um, okay, uh, we have a very short time for questions, so let's maybe take two or three. After that, um, we're, I'm going to release you to to buy uh, to buy the, the, these wonderful books. Um, and um, uh, let me actually, I, sh I should just say that if for those of us, for those uh, watching on Zoom, um, you can go to the uh, the website of the Library of the Jewish People. That's the ljp.org. And put in code BEGIN and you get 20% off. Um, so that's also good to know. Um, but they are on sale outside. Um, and Gil will be, will be signing, of course. Um, so I want to let people um, go to do that with, before they get too tired. But let's take a couple of questions before we do that. So who has a question for Jakob or Gil? Gentleman with the beard. That, just wait a second, sir. And that, uh, my colleague Lily will bring you the, the mic. Joy to hear you, Gil, and a joy to hear you, uh, to hear that the Jerusalem Post lives and advocates and is able to uh, not only question but respond very often as to what could be done if it only would be done. Uh, but I would like to say to you the following, recognizing that so many of us are so embedded in Zionism and in the Zionism of so many great thinkers and so many different strands to the thinking, where do we go from here with our youth? I think the key is how does education from here proceed to create that evolution of Zionism that was at the very outset with Herzl, but needs to be looked at very carefully. How do you bring the strands together between the Jabotinskys of this world and the first prime minister of, Canada, of Israel who would have understood that? And how do we bring that out to the world in some type of Hasbara if we could? Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll give you a cheap answer and a more complicated answer. The cheap answer is, as I said at the very beginning, we're really in what I'm calling the arc of Zionist triumph. 125 years ago, we sell, 125 years ago, we had the Zionist Congress, and we celebrated that in August. This week, we should be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN partition plan. But I saw one or two articles in the Jerusalem Post, but beyond that, I haven't felt the joy in the streets of Jerusalem. And I think we failed. And so we have an opportunity for a redo because at the end of April, we're having the 75th anniversary of the state of Israel. 
And I think the columns that I've written that have been least paid attention to in, in the last couple of months, and there's a long list of those, but have been the ones calling on our president and calling on Hollywood and calling on Jews around the world to stand up and start preparing for this 75th anniversary. And if we, we we're, that's an easy one, that's a gimme, right? It's so easy and you put politics aside and you put partisanship, partisanship aside and you just look at the 75 year old miracle. And we need our philanthropists to start writing big checks. We need our Hollywood directors to start thinking big thoughts. You know, they could put together a Saturday night Seder during COVID, which got over a million hits um, back at, at the height of COVID. And, and now they have months of run up and I'm asking my few friends in Hollywood, what are you doing? And they say, oh, it's complicated. Uh, when we've got to get past complicated and start celebrating and start finding that space where we put politics aside and, and find the vision. That's the simple answer. The more complicated answer is it is we're, we're, all, we're all in a journey. We're all trying to figure out how do we shape the conversation? How do we remember? You know, and wearing my American history uh, mortarboard, the Puritans had the same problem because the Puritans came over on the boat, right? It wasn't the boat that brought the, eight, the 2 million Jews from 1880 to 1920 to America. Um, it wasn't the boats that brought the Jews to Palestine. It was the boat, the, 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 the Mayflower and all those other boats. And they came over and they had zeal. And they were young people and they were changing the world. And they had a whole debate about what about the second generation? What about the third generation? Are they part of the elect? Do they truly feel the same connection? And are they do they truly have the same responsibility? And if I really believe that we had done a great job with Zionist education, both in the diaspora and in Israel. And our youth were not interested because we had given them the best we could, the most exciting vision we could, and they just weren't buying it. I'd say, okay, you know, we failed. But I think we haven't done a good enough job. And I think the possibilities to bring that excitement, and I see it with birthright participants. Um, and I see it when I travel around the United States and I see it when I go to Mechinot and, and I speak to people like your daughter, um, and I talk to them about a Zionism that isn't Mia Marla Mia, Zionism that isn't about this street name and that street name, or, or passing this bagrut or that bagrut. It's about a Zionism that's alive. And I think that's the hope of the, with the Herzl Project. I think that's the hope that every time we sit and we write about Zionism, we're trying to say, this thing is alive and it's yours, and you can define it, and you can change it, and you can make it grow. Uh, another question? Do we have another question? Yes. Let's see. You have to get down to the front. Let's, I want to make sure everyone can hear. Okay. With the process of reclaiming our identity as Jews with power and sovereignty, I see the biggest danger presented on the so-called left is that we need to de-assimilate from Stock, the Stockholm syndrome induced by the centuries of abuse and bullying in Europe and the morality they imposed on our people rather than our own. On the so-called right, we see a fundamentalist reaction and fictionalization of the Jewish past and our traditions that ignore a lot of the complexities of internal and international relations. How do we reclaim our identity as Jews today? And how much does that play a part in what it is to be a Zionist now? You answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm very proud of the Jewish people. At a time when the left and the right is so deeply divided, we've given the far left and the far right something on which to agree, Jew hatred. And really, that's really, you know, and we've been doing this for many, many years, you know, because uh, we've, been, we've been too rich and too poor, too Marxist and too Rothschild. We fit in too much and we stand out too much. And, you know, and, and this actually goes back to, 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 to Melanie's remarks. Um, I, I feel the tension in Herzl. I feel the trauma in Herzl. I feel the distress in Herzl. But one of the things I kept on emphasizing is this, this, this Hatikva moment this leap of hope for centuries, the Jews were stuck in the leap of faith. And I don't want to disrespect the leap of faith because of course that was so important and, and, and our spirituality and our identity is, is, is so critical. But at that moment, it was paralyzing us. And Herzl understood that what's the leap of hope? That tomorrow will be better than today. And the leap of hope is also that we roll up our sleeves and make it happen. We don't just wait passively. And that's the Zionist idea. And that's what Leon Wieselter call, calls Bitsuist Zionism. And that's when you see Herzl tinkering and Herzl fixing and Herzl brainstorming, that you see he understood that side of it too, that it wasn't just the power of an idea up here. The power of an idea is to move forces and to move, and he, and, and he talks about how flags are just scribbles, but a flag can get people to live and die and can also give them something to live for and something to die for. And I think right here in this holy city of Jerusalem, and also Melanie, at the end, you, you, you framed this in terms of nationalism and religion, um, and this extraordinary state, we have an opportunity to speak to the world and say that our vision of liberal nationalism 
is one that is deeply liberal in the best sort of way, not the illiberal liberalism you see in the far left. And it's also deeply nationalist, not the horrific xenophobic nationalism we see on the far right. I don't, I'm confused. I don't know how to live in a world where progressives don't believe in progress and conservatives don't conserve institutions. And I think right here, we have to learn, we have to show that we're figuring out how to believe in progress and how to conserve institutions. And it's not a matter of left or right, it's a matter of Zionism and it starts with Herzl and it continues. I, I just wanna add one thing. And that is, you know, uh, I mentioned my daughter before, but she called me, uh, this was the first election that she voted in a few weeks ago. And she calls me a couple, two weeks before, and she says, you know, I, I've, I'm thinking about who to vote for. And I was hoping it wasn't gonna be at least one party, but yeah. Uh, and she's debating between a couple of parties, but she was Googling and looking online to see what they stand for and to read their platform. And she was trying to do her homework. And she said, I can't find it. Where, where's the platform? And I said, oh, cause it doesn't exist, right? Because we don't, we, we, we've, we don't, what do we stand for, right? What are the political, so we know who doesn't sit with BB, we know who sits with BB, and we know who would never sit with BB, but then we know who might sit with BB if the things, but, but what, what is their vision? What are their politicians? And alone, I know we have a, we have a politician who's here with us and uh, uh, he's the exception, but, but, there's, but there's plenty, but I wonder sometimes what do these people really stand for? What is their vision for the state of Israel? And, and, and they don't have that. And that ties back to what I spoke about, what I mentioned before is this, this place where we are right now in, in the history of the Jewish people and in the state of Israel is we have this opportunity to create a vision. And instead, or what we could do is, is what the politicians love to do is to scare us all the time and to scare us from the, 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 you know, the Iranians or Hamas or the hostile president in the United States or the UN. Uh, but we have to solve our issues here and we have this opportunity, but we can't because we're constantly being pulled apart as opposed to being brought together, as I think Gil said so beautifully. Okay, um, I want to thank very, very much um, all of our speakers today, um, Gil Troy, Yaakov Katz, Manny Phillips, Matthew Miller. Um, it's been, um, I think it's been a, a really um, eye-opening event. And for those of you who maybe hadn't dipped your toe into the uh, the very uh, substantial uh, waters that Herzl can provide for us, then this is a, this is a great way of, um, of, of introducing us to it and to the, this wonderful box set that, that Corin produced. Um, as I said, please do um, purchase uh, a box set upstairs or, on, uh, or online via the uh, ljp.org website. Again, write the word Begin for a 20% discount. Um, and I, I do just want to say that... Um, I, uh, I had a conversation with someone uh, a couple of weeks ago, but after the elections, um, who was talking about how f they were, they live in the United States, and they were saying how the fight dealing with anti-Zionists on campus is now going to be more difficult because of the negative press um, with the new um, that the new putative new uh, Israeli government uh, would uh, would provoke. You could agree or disagree with that press is justified, obviously, um, but. Um, and I said that, that I think the point is that anti-Zionists are not anti this or that government. That's not the point. The point is that anti-Zionists, right? So we should be fighting for whatever our views of whichever government it is. Um, we should be proud of Zionism as a revolutionary movement and what it did and what it created here. Um, and the uh, and the state of Israel and the state of Israel for all that it can, for all that it has achieved, for all that it can achieve. Um, whether, again, whether you like this government or, or the previous government or whatever, um, there's something, there needs to be something that transcends politics and this divide um, that we have in this country. And I think that one way of entering that, um, uh, that conversation is by reading Herzl, reading Jabotinsky, reading um, Weizmann, Begin, Ben-Gurion, and, and the great luminaries um, that, that we have in our, in our, in our uh, Zionist canon. Which we hope to see in the in the next in future editions of the Library of the Jewish People uh, publication. So thank you everyone for coming, and um, we'll see you again soon.